I am Jason Bricardo. I am a systems administrator for Forget Computers. We're a managed service provider in Chicago. Uh, if you're in the Casper world, you may have heard of us because we make a couple products um, called Dashboard and Robot Cloud. And Twitter and Mac Admin Slack Z at Zuku. And I'm Robert Hammond. I am the Mac team lead for the National Center for Biotechnology Information at the National Institutes of Health. Uh, runs the government's most popular website. Uh, 11 months out of the year anyway. IRS.gov always wins April, but uh, if you go to PubMed, that's the team of people that I support, people that are responsible for everything from running the web servers to the content management and so on. So why us? Um, in the past 15 years, uh, between the two of us, we've become really familiar with the experience of changing companies, changing jobs, uh, changing locations. We are by no means experts on this topic, but we've got some experience and we thought we'd want to share it with you today. Uh, you know, each one of those is basically a year where one or both of us was switching to jobs. So, making the decision to leave. Uh, this is something that you probably shouldn't take very lightly. And everybody's going to have a different reason to leave. My commute sucks. I hate my boss. Um, some people, uh, you know, they want the challenge, uh, and that's what they look for in a job. Uh, and when they eventually hit a block point in their current job where they're just no longer able to learn anything new, uh, it's not presenting any new challenge for them. And so that's an incentive to go. Some people may have just reached the LP potential. This is as far as I can go. Or you've gotten really good at working at the place and, you know, you're bored. Maybe you've decided to make the jump to management. Or maybe <laughs> through one, one reason or another, they've decided to make you the boss. Uh, company reorganizations are also another prime motivator to go. Um, you know, you want to get out before they ask you to get out. The old saying is that uh, you don't leave jobs, you leave bosses. And that's certainly been true in my case. Uh, this slide, uh, I saw this actually, this was not in our notes, and I saw this a couple days ago on Twitter, and I went, oh my god, this is perfect. If you can't see it, it's a vending machine that said, the light inside is broken, but I still work. That was me at my last job. This is a more negative version of, this is, this is burnout in the, in the slide, right there. So, when it is not just a single bad day at the office, uh, when you keep returning to the idea, uh, you know, could you go, should you go, um, this is where you're going to be thinking about. Uh, you know, in my case, the past couple job switches, uh, you know, a few years ago, a place I really liked working, uh, but, you know, I just kind of felt, I got really good at doing things there, and I didn't think the skill set was going to uh, be transferable to another place. Uh, you know, it was just sort of stagnant. A uh, couple jobs ago, uh, I really liked the place I worked for, generally liked everyone I worked with, uh, but I had a horrible manager. Like, he was just not a nice person. Uh, and, you know, workload goes up, bad manager, just not a good combination. Uh, and then my last job, uh, when I got it, had no intent of leaving. You know, it was a fine place to work, had a really great boss. And unfortunately, uh, last June, um, the company that owned our company is like, oh, hey, we're outsourcing all IT. So, you know, July 1st, I start looking for a new job. In my case, as I mentioned before, burnout was one of the primary considerations. Uh, I've been doing consulting for 10 years, worrying about everybody's different environments for different periods of time, and not a single environment. Plus, being the fact that I don't have any kids, I was always the guy that got to travel. Oh, we're going to send you here, and then we're going to send you here, and then you have to go to St. Louis two weeks out of the month for six months. And I, <laughs> that was worn on me. Um, and then I had a micromanaging boss that certainly didn't appreciate the amount of work, time, and effort that I put in. Um, or the $150,000 a year client that I brought with me. And the last straw for me when I knew I really had to leave the job was when they did a benefit cut to eliminate uh, a health savings account that he had previously fully funded. And the way health savings accounts work here in the United States, that money is you know, pre-tax. And that was effectively a, a, a $10,000 pay cut. That was the last straw. I knew I had to go. So uh, getting to the, the decision uh, that it's, you know, agreeing with yourself that it's time to go uh, isn't easy. There's many factors. Uh, you know, you might be married, you have a partner, uh, you might have kids. Uh, it might entail moving locations. Uh, you know, think about the quality of the work you're doing and what you might be doing. Uh, the chance that it might all fall apart, like you switch jobs and, hey, it turns out to be horrible. Um, but once you, you know, you've got to come to that decision yourself. 
and you get to that point in time, like I did, where you, you, there's got to be a change. You just made a decision. I'm, I'm going. Um, generally, this is true. The company's not going to suddenly decide to give benefits back, or the boss isn't going to suddenly start to not micromanage you. So um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to leave, but if you want to maintain your sanity, you probably do. And there's always an XKCD for anything. And the, the, based on the number of jobs that I've had in my professional career, this is completely accurate. So one of the best things that you should do when you're at that point is start making lists. I love making lists. Maybe I don't always follow them, but list, what is your intent? What are you, feelings, opinions, thoughts about why you want to leave? Think about what you want to be doing. And keep in mind, as, as you look, you may find, realize that what you want to do and what's actually available in the job market might be two separate things. The point is to have something that you can keep referring back to and you keep thinking about as you go through your job search. Um, you know, I personally, you know, go along with this list thing. Uh, I use Omni Outliner to do all sorts of stuff like this. Uh, in the links that we have at the end, um, there's a new product that we heard about a couple weeks ago where it's essentially kind of like Trello, but for, you know, doing your job search. Uh, so there's tools out there if you're looking for something. <sighs> if you need a starting point, uh, when you start to do all this consideration, uh, you, know, you can start with this question. Is it me or the job? Uh, is there something else I'm looking for? Um, job's really annoying. Job isn't paying as much. Start with that question and then start to make your decision tree from there. So why are you leaving your job? Well, there's a good chance this is going to be a, a complete surprise to your bosses if when you do give notice. They're going to ask you to reconsider, but generally it's never a good idea. If you've gotten to that point, if you've gone through a made list about why you're going to leave the job, the point of them getting you to reconsider is basically to keep you there long enough to find your replacement. And as far as you know, having this, you know, the explanation ready, um, jump ahead a little bit. You know, years ago I used to work for a company. Um, I knew it was time to go. I could see that you know the office was going to be closing down, so I went and got a new job. Um, the day that I found out I got the new job and was ready to give notice, um, it was in December, I had lost my voice. So I had to go into my boss's boss's office where him and my boss were at, uh, closed the door and went to talk and like nothing could come out. So I basically had to like pantomime my, you know, I'm leaving. <laughs> Did you tell him you were starting your new career as a mime? <laughs> yeah. So again, when you, you know, Prospective employees are going to ask you, so why are you interested in, 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 in this job? Why are you leaving your current job? Don't be negative. Don't say, my boss is a jerk. You know, because that's immediately, oh, this guy's a troublemaker. He's out. You have to come up with a po something positive. Now, in the exit interview, um, you know, most HR departments are going to want to do this. Uh, you know, they're going to want details. Um, if someone has been a jerk, this is probably the place to bring it up. Uh, you know, it's not going to matter to you anymore, but maybe you can save your coworkers from an insufferable boss. And have positive reasons. Uh, you know, you're going to be talking to recruiters, hiring managers. Um, employers want someone who's going to fit well on their team. Uh, and so if you have a bunch of cranky reasons, uh, you're not going to fit well. Uh, you know, cranky doesn't necessarily equal teamwork. Yeah, and I think this is the one we're, uh, we're talking about when I actually had my interview with my current job, and, and uh, about 10 minutes in, I, you know, I got the, what do you like to do outside of work? Well, I, you know, one of my things is craft beer. There's a bunch of beer from Massachusetts on the floor here that somebody brought here for me. Um, and it was, I, walked, I looked at the two other people I was interviewing with, and they were, like, looking at me, and we started talking about, we spent the rest of the interview talking about craft beer because they were also beer nerds, so it was pretty obvious that I fit on the team. All right, it's time to update your resume. Uh, ideally, you've been keeping it kept up as you've been working. Um, good rule of thumb that I've developed is, you know, six months into a new job, get your resume updated. Um, you know, things happen. Uh, you never know what's going to come down the pike, uh, so be ready. Some companies actually uh, want you to keep your resume updated and provide to them for during your performance reviews. My current employer did that. Uh, the other thing is, you know, the general guidance is keep it two pages, you know, front and back. Um, it doesn't have to be a laundry list. You don't have to list every job you've ever had. Um, the other thing is make a PDF version of it. Put it on Dropbox. Put it on your own site. Uh, that way, if you have uh, someone comes along and says, hey, you know, I heard you're looking for a job. You have your resume. You can easily send them a link. Uh, the other thing is make a text version. 
Um, all these job application sites, uh, some of them you can copy and paste in, some you can't. Uh, some of them will scrape your resume off of a PDF or a Word file, but they usually wreck it. If you have it in text, you can just copy it in, and you know things are going to be right. So LinkedIn, even if you want to avoid all the networking and headhunter asp you know, asp aspects of LinkedIn, you should create a profile. It, it really is required. I went through this with somebody else who recently did just get a new job where he didn't have LinkedIn. I'm like, dude, you have to be out there. Realize you don't want to. A lot of job sites actually use, if, they're, if they are, jobs are posted through LinkedIn or they're tied to LinkedIn, when you go to apply for that job, it'll ask to single sign on to your LinkedIn profile and you can just take your information right there. It's click, easy. Um, potential employers are gonna do a web search for you. They're gonna Google you. Uh, so look at your public presence. Uh, you know, your Twitter account if you have one. Uh, things you've set on Slack. If you have a GitHub, uh, maybe it's time to clean it up. Um, basically, just you know, think about how you're presenting yourself to the world. And if you're on Facebook, sorry, Mike, lock down your profile. You just don't, don't want anybody in the world to see uh, you know, what you're posting, what you're talking about your family, and things like that. You know, if you have trusted coworkers, you know, obviously you can't tell everyone that you're looking for a new job, but trust coworkers, friends, uh, acquaintances, let them know you're looking. Um, it might not lead to anything, but you never know when something's going to come along. My job for app that I took, for example, uh, was posted on the jobs board uh, back in Macabin Slack in December of 2015. I saw it. I'm like, well, that's in Maryland. I'm not going to move there. But I was talking to a friend, Rich Troughton, and uh, about expressed my frustrations and concerns about my current role, and he's like, oh, well, there's a job at NIH, and you know that's a really great place to work. And I, you, you might those are really good people. You might want to go look at that. And that's what really what changed my mind. So, both of us obviously living in the U.S., we can only speak about the U.S. job market. Uh, most of the information we're talking about is it applies to the U.K., France, Australia, Japan, and elsewhere. But local practices will affect. Our, you know, the advice. For example, healthcare is obviously a big concern for people here, not so much in other countries. And regrettably, it might matter, you know, are you a woman? The uh, job market's going to, you know, might be different. Uh, you're not a white guy. Uh, you know, you're older than 50. Uh, there's going to be factors beyond your control that you might not, you know, might impact your job search. Um, hopefully, the real problematic companies you're not even going to be concerned with. And, you know, everything we're talking about is based on our experience. You know, you're, you know, look at us. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, but hopefully it's applicable to everybody. So one of the big questions is degree, because there's a lot of people who don't have degrees. I'm one of them. Or they have a degree in something esoteric. If, even if the job listing uh, specifies a degree, don't let that be a barrier to you to apply. Um, because if you have experience and certifications, that might make a difference. And a lot of times, HR departments love to throw the degree in there, and the hiring manager doesn't care. Yeah, you know, uh, or, you know, I might not think you're degree applies. I mean, I have a cinematography degree that has nothing to do with IT. Um. Yeah, I didn't finish my degree because I was running out of cash and I was working two jobs and I kept getting hired for trying to go back to school and kept getting hired full time. All right, you are all likely at this conference because you specialize in supporting Apple systems. Um, the industries and organizations that, you know, need Apple support tend to be clustered, you know, San Francisco, Seattle, Austin, New York, DC. Um, We see this all the time on, um, on, the, on the jobs chat board on Mac and Slack. We'll work remotely for Bay Area money. Um, probably the biggest market is where Apple admins right now is San Francisco, then New York and DC. But one thing to keep in mind is that there are actually are some people, some of you in this room, who have uh, gamed the system and have uh, gotten a Bay Area job but didn't have to live in the Bay Area. Yeah. Um, couldn't find anything newer, uh, but in 2010, Experian uh, did a report about sort of the Apple market uh, and where people are buying Apple devices. Uh, we've got the link for that in our notes, uh, but it kind of gives you an idea of you know parts of the country, at least in the U.S., um, that might be potential job markets. Where you live uh, might impede your ability to easily switch jobs just because of the number of available positions. Um, you know, other factors aside, location is going to impact us all. Um, personally, the barrier was not work for me because you know me and my family can't afford to live out there. And I ended up moving myself 850 miles away to the East Coast uh, after my life situation changed. So, uh, bear in mind, a job search is going to take time. You're not going to apply for that job this week and get an interview the following week and start two weeks after that. 
it's a marathon and a sprint. You've got to find worthwhile places to apply. Yeah, you're going to spend time researching companies, uh, researching positions. You know, what is a CPE? What's an SRE? Like all that sort of stuff. Um, and then, you know, hopefully you're going to be spending some time interviewing. The who, what, when, where, and how. All right, we don't want to recommend one job site over another. Uh, there's a bunch of them out there. Um, you know, and the, what might have been recommended five years ago isn't necessarily recommended now. Uh, take a look at them all, see what fits you. Uh, you know, some of them might be better for uh, listings in the, your part of the country than, you know, my part of the country. Uh, but we've got some general recommendations over how to work with these sites. If you use Apple as a search term, you're going to get a lot of things that probably aren't applicable. So you need to think about specifics, things like Casper, Jamf, Monkey, MDM, one-to-one, -one, et cetera. The technologies you want to be working with. No matter what site you use, automated alerts are a wonderful thing, uh, even if they will spam your inbox. Let the computers work for you. Uh, search out job boards on particular verticals. Uh, you know, higher education. There's a there's a couple different higher education job boards. Um, if you're in the age, you know, ad agency, there's ad agency boards. Um, government sites. Uh, you know, something like the Jamf job board. It's usually focused around jobs related to working with Casper, but not always. Every once in a while you see something where it's just a general Mac admin that they're looking for. Uh, and the other thing on Mac admin Slack, you know, the jobs board channel. You know, you, you're now going to be researching where you want to work, what kind of work you want to do. Um, Startup companies, software companies, tend to be big places, uh, you know, Apple consumers. Uh, are there any startups in your area? Um, there might be meetups associated with them. There might be specialty uh, websites associated with them. Like in Chicago, we've got this uh, built in Chicago. Um, so you can start searching through sites like that for potential jobs, companies you might be interested in work for. Uh, think about what are the major industries in your area. Um, you know, do some research in them. Uh, do they have any special sites? Uh, you know, like San Diego, could, you know, look at biotech. Or like in Boston, biotech firms and associated websites. If you're, if you're interested in relocating, if you've got a specific area in mind, or if you find a job that uh, looks interesting to you, start researching that city's industries. Start looking at what other opportunities might exist for you in that area. If you've got an affinity for a particular company, are they hiring? Look at their website. They probably have a career section. Keep an eye on it. Yeah, and I usually develop a list of companies that I'm interested in, just keep a track, check in, you know, weekly, every other week, um, when I'm looking. Are there any meetups like Mac admins or even, you know, Jamf admins or whatever, that, it, that it, you know, a topic of subject, networking, available where you live? Do you go? Get out and meet people. A lot of times jobs are done through networking. Um, and if you're lucky enough to be at a conference like this, talk to people. Opportunities come up. Don't be afraid to approach the Rich Troutons and the Mike Lins of the world. Talk to people in the jobs chat channel. That's what it's for. Hey, I heard about this job, or what do you think about the job market in Seattle, or whatever. Yeah, you're not going to get raccooned in there. Um, LinkedIn has an option where you can basically say, let recruiters know I'm looking. Uh, it's under the profiles, privacy, settings. Um, but if you turn that on, uh, you might get some calls and emails from headhunters. Uh, respond to them if it's something you're interested in. And again, get, again, get yourself out there. Get involved in the community. Contribute to meetups. If, are there open source projects you can work on? Can you contribute code? Do what we're doing. Speak at a conference. Uh, and depending on the size of your company, uh, you know, you like the company you work for, but not necessarily where you work or you want to relocate. Um, switching jobs within your company might be an option. Uh, most sites, uh, most places usually have like an internal jobs board you can check out. Um, as you're looking for a job, uh, you find interesting places, now's the time to become an investigator. You want to learn about those places. Uh, one particular site I found very useful in job search is Glassdoor. I found uh, generally when I looked up places that I've worked, it's been pretty spot on. And uh, it's kind of given me the, oh, I'm going to stay away from that. Again, also look in jobs chat. Find out, hey, so-and-so used, this, oh, this guy used to work there. Let me send him a direct message and find out what he thinks about the role. The other thing is, you know, web searches. You know, company XYZ is a horrible place to work. Or uh, lots of places, uh, like in Chicago, Cranes does best places to work in Chicago 2017. Look at that list. The company you're looking at, are they on there? Something like that. Now, something important to do. As you apply, keep a list of where, for what, and when. 
Also, keep a copy of the job description. Yep. Yeah. Um, I, I've had this where, you, you know, I've applied for a job and then I get an interview request and I go, go to look at the job description and it's gone. And I wanted to kind of prepare myself for that interview with that when it was gone. So make sure you, you know, copy, paste, scrapbook. And another thing too is keep track of like job IDs because uh, companies might post a job under 190, pull it, repost it again, job ID change, maybe like they had to switch their budget around, maybe it's going to report to a different hire man hiring manager. Uh, so keep track of that so when you apply and they start talking to you about it, you have an idea of what exactly you're going for. Hiring process. So it's a black hole. We, we don't, you know, nobody know, really knows. I don't even think HR knows uh, how companies decide to respond to an application sub submission and, and when they're going to act on them. It's uh, a black hole of mystery. <laughs> um, I do have some numbers based on my job hunts in 2015 and 2016. Uh, that can hopefully provide a little context. So, number of positions I applied for, 22, 2015, you know, spreading a wide net. Um, number of places I applied for were just didn't get any response, no word, no nothing. You know, 10 to 14, kind of a high uh, ratio there. Uh, number of positions were, you know, I got back, oh, you're not really exactly what we're looking for. Um, Number of times, you know, I had one interview, talked to the, usually, you know, the recruiting manager, or, um, you know, just wasn't a good fit or like, you know, what they came through with salary was lower than what I was looking for. <laughs> it's, you know, a uh, number of times where I had multiple interviews. Uh, this was, these numbers apply to, you know, the jobs where uh, I ended up working both those years. And then lastly, you know, for my last job that I, had last year and then my current job, the total number of interviews it took me to get, you know, to the job. Yeah, I think I had, I, I think I had three for my job. Yeah. And then last, uh, from, you know, when I submitted my application uh, to when I signed my offer letter, as you can see, that's how long it took, you know, four months. Uh, like we said, this is a marathon. It took me about 70 days of mine. Uh, you're going to be waiting. So one of the things to keep in mind is, even if you're ready to head out the door, don't mentally head out the door. Stay focused on your current job. All right, uh, as you start going to interviews, your first interview is likely gonna be with the recruiter. And again, this is where it comes back to keeping a copy of that job application. Because what you wanna do is you wanna, when you're talking to that recruiter, you wanna make sure that you're making a pitch to them about how your skill set matches what they're looking for. And it's also a good idea because they're going to ask, so do you have any questions for us about our company? Put some thought into those questions. <sighs> okay, this is the part nobody likes to talk about. Usually, that, in the initial interview, you'll get the question about salary. Um, but if you're, you know, don't go backwards at all. If you're looking for a pay increase, be ready to, sp you know, to mention that number. Yeah. And if you don't know what that number should be, uh, look for salary surveys. Um, got a couple in the links. Uh, someone on Mac Admins tried to organize one just on the Mac Admin Slack. Uh, I think it had about 80 or 90, 90 entries in it. Uh, there's a couple other ones through like Network World and places like that. You can go out and find them. You know, you give them your email address and they spam you for the rest of your life, but then you get the PDF. Uh, if you're looking to relocate, uh, keep in mind cost of living adjustments. Uh, we've got a couple cost of living calculators in the links too. Yeah, that's one of the things that skews the salary uh, surveys because depending on where people live. Yeah. Um, if you really don't want to talk numbers yet, uh, an eloquent way to put it is, well, I don't want to drop down, down below my current salary, but I'd really like to wait until we get further along in the, the discussion and I know about what more would be expected of me. After the first call, you might not go any further in the process. Uh, you might have several more interviews. Uh, each company is going to be different. Um, common pattern interviews, you know, you have a interview with the recruiter, have an interview with the hiring manager, uh, probably going to have a team interview, uh, and then probably in-person interviews. For all these interviews, think critically about what you do. Think of a way to concisely describe what you do. Um, can you find a way to put your longer-term goals into a couple sentences? I want to run the company. Well, maybe not that. But uh, it's also a good idea to talk about a couple of projects you've done at your current role and t tell a story about them. Yeah, I took on this project when this happened and we had to crash and burn and get this done in two weeks and I got it taken care of. Um, again, review that job description. 
based on what they say they're looking for, think about what they're going to ask you about why you fit that role. And it's not a half bad idea to write out what you're going to say. Anticipate those questions and write the answers. You know, practice. Um, think of probing questions to help you figure out what the interview or what the position might be like. Um, you know. So think questions like, you know, what's the turnover rate? When was the last time somebody's out of the team? Why did the previous person leave? Um, you know, is there a pager duty? Do you have to be on call in the hours? How often am I be traveling for this role? How big is your team? Uh, what is your computer management system? How long have you been using that system? Uh, how many machines are being managed? Things like that. Um, when you go to the in-person interviews, pay attention to the surroundings. Uh, you know, once you get past the snazzy startup office, you know, how they're presenting themselves, uh, pay attention to how people are working in the space. Uh, what's the mood feel like? Are people moving around? They're everybody's silent? Everybody got headphones on? Uh, you know, is it going to be someplace you really want to be in? Your gut feeling really does matter. Um, if there was something in any of those interviews that gave you pause, pay attention to that. Um, at that point, you can decide to stop interviewing to decline further consideration. Um, and I'll tell a little story. I actually just got headhunted recently out of the blue for a job at the Securities and Exchange Commission. And it was a sizable salary increase over what I'm making now. And so I took the time out of my schedule to do a phone interview. And after talking with the, the contracting company's Mac expert, who tried to, uh, you know, his, his, his main role of the interview was to prove that he was smarter than me, I was like, nope, don't want to go there. Uh, the interview process is going to take longer than you hoped it would. So just be patient. At some point, you're going to be going for a job that you really want, and you're not going to get it. It's no fun. It really sucks. Um, yeah, we, nobody really knows what too qualified means. Probably means too much money. Um, most companies want to get you have a, find a candidate with a broad range of skills and experience at the cheapest price. So, the offer. You did it. They like you. They really, really like you. Uh, when the offer comes in, it's time to examine every aspect of it. Uh, do a side-by-side -side comparison with what, you, what your benefits and salary are now uh, and what they're offering. Things that you have to look at. Obviously, salary, but also things like health care, particularly in the U.S. Other benefits. Do I get a 401k match? Vacations, time off. Oh, guess you get unlimited vacations. Well, that's a trap. What hours are you, how many hours do you expect to work a week? What hours are you expected to be on the staff? What's your commute going to be like? Can you work from home? How often can you work from home? Will they provide you with equipment? What's that equipment going to be like? Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, this is your last chance to think about how this job is going to affect you. Uh, and it's not just you, it's your family, um, you know, your partner. How is this going to impact them? Uh, you know, what adjustments are you going to have to make to take this new job? Are you actually ready to make a change if it does require something significant? And is this going to change your life for the better? If you're relocating, this is a big thing. What's the cost of living adjustment going to be like? I ran into this because it's certainly a lot cheaper to live in the Milwaukee area. I was paying $955 a month for rent than in the Washington, D.C. metro area where I'm paying about 2200 bucks a month for rent. Uh, think about things like, you know, what are the schools like in the new area you're moving to? Uh, will you get time to move? First question I asked after I got the offer was, uh, so can you help out with the relocation? Is there a sticking point in the offer for you? Uh, can you resolve it? Uh, you know, is it, you know, the salary a little bit lower than what you want, things like that. Now is the time to figure things out and get them hashed out. So I'll give you a perfect example. When I hit my role, uh, we, we got to the point where we discussed the number um, and we were okay with it. And I talked to a friend of mine who lives in the metro area and actually works for the State Department. And she promptly said, oh, no, you need to ask for more because the cost of living delta is this. And here's the web government website that shows this. So I kind of just took her email and said, so about this number, I know we talked about it, but I really feel a little bit more comfortable with this. And they're like, okay. And I'm like, damn, I should have asked for more. Um, things might not work out and you have to decline the offer. Um, find a way to politely refuse. Uh, you don't burn any bridges because who knows, maybe like a couple months they come back and be like, yeah, we looked at everybody else. You're really what we want. Uh, we're really to adjust our offer, make the change that you were looking for. So. You say yes, congratulations, now it's time to quit. Talk to your manager, 
Uh, talk to HR, because most companies have an official process. Uh, usually you're going to have to write some sort of uh, resignation letter, email. Uh, most companies require one. And be prepared. Um, for example, financially, uh, things like health, in health insurance, again, a, a more of a US-centric thing, in case they ask you to leave. Um, they may not be obligated to pay out any vacation time or pay out your two weeks. So be financially ready to not get a paycheck for that time. Um, figure out what makes sense for you uh, as far as finishing up projects, closing up tasks, uh, documentation, things like that. You're probably going to come up with a long list like, oh, here's everything that needs to be done. Uh, you're not going to accomplish it. No one ever does. Of course, it goes without saying you should uh, probably before you quit, you should clean out personal files and work equipment, making a backup of anything that you want to keep for future reference if you're allowed to, things like scripts, packages, documentation, etc. cetera. And uh, it's always a fine line about cleaning your office out without making it look very apparent that you're leaving your job. One good tip that I wish I'd done at my last job is on your way out the door, make some notes, make a folder. Throw in business card if you had one. Um, has the company address, any of your titles you've had, your salaries, what you started at, what you finished at, um, everything from, you know, your, your, if you've got old pay stubs, all of your old 1099s, any reviews, any card copies of performance reviews, et cetera. Because you might need the info either for a career role or even just for a financial role in the future. If you're going to buy a house, go into debt significantly, they want to know that you're stable. So welcome to the new job. It's your first day. Uh, some of these things are things we figured out after the fact. <laughs> um, but sort of just sort of strategy, coping strategies for the new place. So the onboarding. That first day, don't expect to get any actual work done. That first day is going to be you getting into HR systems, learning the ropes. And every company has a different process, and some are better at it than others. Um, you're going to fill out a lot of paperwork, sign your, sign your name, bring a lot of forms, make sure to remember, remember to bring your IDs with you. Uh, there's a good chance you're going to question yourself and your ability to do the job. Uh, you know, you're kind of sitting there like, oh my god, what did I just do? Um, Lots of people would have been mistaken in hiring you. Uh, you know, lots of people would have had to make the mistake saying, oh, we really want that person. Um, have some confidence in yourself. You're there for a reason. So uh, pro tips, practices, warnings um, that we run into. So as you actually get to start to work, um, you're going to have a lot of questions. And if you keep running to your coworkers all the time you have a question, you're going to be considered the annoying new guy. So what the things you, that's, you can do is start writing down questions. You know, keep some kind of document or even paper about things. And some of these things, you know, hey, I don't know how to log into this system. Can you help me? That's obviously one you're going to need help with. But there's some other things you could probably spend some time looking at trying to figure out, looking, looking at existing documentation and things like that. Yeah, and you're not going to get answers for everything, uh, but just, you know, you're engaging yourself. Uh, and now's the time to do it because you're new. Everyone's going to give you a little bit of leeway. Uh, and then if you're lucky enough to have any overlap with your predecessor, um, very politely drain their brain. So um, I have a really good memory, but I'm terrible with names. You can tell you, hey, I'm Joe. Oh, hey, and then five minutes later, oh, it's that guy. I know he works here, and I can't remember his name. So uh, write them down. Make sure you ask people who they are and what they do. And you know, you're going to be overwhelmed because you're getting so much information thrown at you. So you will, you will thank yourself for doing this later. And generally, unless it's a really uh, not a great environment, most of your coworkers are going to be willing to help you. And don't pass up that offer to help. And if you're lucky enough to have someone who's going to sherpa you through the new company, uh, be very thankful that person. Maybe down the road you end up buying them lunch. So, and you're going to find this, especially when you work in the government. Uh, every company and team has acronyms and shorthand for things that they use. When you run across something like this, try to figure it out. Write it on that list. When you have time, ask somebody, what, what is IRB anyway? Uh, people are going to talk about clients, users, managers, processes. Uh, pay attention to what they're saying. Uh, you are not necessarily have to chime in. Chime in, just you know, keep an ear out for what they're talking about. But again, if there's something you don't understand, don't hesitate to ask about it. OK, so here's, here's a great, great thing to do, if you're, especially if you have a role where you have to interact and help with people, a help desk type role. If somebody's got a problem and you know your coworker is going to their desk, ask to tag along. 
That way is a good way to get the lay of the land. The coworker will hopefully introduce you to this person. You can get kind of an information about what this person's like, what kind of problems they have. And it, it's just like, sort of like building a map. Um, hopefully, the company you go to work for has existing documentation. Uh, read through it. Can you follow along? Um, as you're onboarding during your first week, month, place, uh, what's all the questions you've had uh, you know, as far as servers, sites, logins? Is that documented? Uh, hopefully it is, and you can go through it. And when you get the question of somebody asking you to go to lunch, don't, don't say, oh, okay, I brought a lunch. Go. They're, they're reaching out to you. When you see an opportunity, uh, volunteer for a project or task. Something comes up, oh, hey, I can do that. Um, it's not necessarily about you doing it. It's about you starting to ingratiate yourself with the team and starting to understand the environment. Um, and plus, doing new things is going to help you learn. Think about the, the previous jobs and, and roles you've had and your experience. And how does what the company is doing currently uh, compare to what you did in the past? Are there things they're doing that are better? Are there things that, that you did in the past that, that are better than what they're doing now? Is there something you can bring to the table to change a workflow or a process to make it smoother? Uh, if there's nothing else you can do during your first few months, uh, start writing documentation. Uh, more likely you don't have any projects, so you've got time. Um, so one of the things at my current role that I started observing was that I kept seeing tickets for the same issues over and over and over. And so I'm like, okay, I, get some, I see some low-hanging fruit here. Let me see what I can do to try to reduce these problems. And you know, it's things, stupid things like keychains on Macs and getting people to use either AD Passmon or now Nomad, change their password on their Mac so you don't get the keychain prompts. You know, tell, telling them that because we use PIV cards that you know, there's, PIV, there's times when you need to enter your PIV pin instead of a password. You know, here's what to do in creating documents. When you have this problem, try this, try this, try this. If you don't know how to fix it, here's how to fix the, here's how to nuke the key change yourself. And then take that step further and put something like that in the Jamf self-service. Uh, you are going to be like this for a while. You are going to get into a disagreement with a coworker. Um, you know, you're new, you are a disruption. Um, Someone's going to object uh, to you know what you're trying to do. Uh, ideally, it's not personal. Ideally, you know you're not going to be getting a fight with someone. They're just you know you're doing things in a different way than what they've always done it because um, you're the new guy. So when you're a Mac admin, the network admins always hate you, and the Windows admins generally don't like you either. So now my, one is my boss. Um, two or three months in, you're likely to get frustrated. Um, you might be feeling a little bit of buyer's remorse. Uh, Maybe things weren't so bad at the old place. You know, how often will I be traveling for this job? Unless you're sold a bill of goods and the new job isn't what you were sold, be patient. Ride it out. It's growing pains. Keep this fact in mind. All of your coworkers have, if not years, months of time that they spent working there before you. They have a head start. You get really to define what your role actually is, and it might not be what's in the job description. This quote, uh, as we were preparing for this, is something, uh, there's a comedy uh, stand-up podcast I listened to. Uh, Bobcat Goldthwait was on there, and this was just sort of a, he was throwaway line that he put before one of his jokes, uh, but I thought it was incredibly appropriate uh, and wanted to conclude with it. A uh, little bit of homework. So uh, Jody Rogers uh, gave a great talk at Max Sysadmin in 2013. Uh, Max Sysadmin's conference is held in Sweden. It's also pretty great. The, the talk was on being happy in your work and quitting. It's something we highly recommend that you view. It's in the, it'll be in the presentation notes. Yep. Managing Humans by Michael Lapp. Uh, he is ex-Borland, ex-Apple, ex-Palantir, a couple different other places. Um, I forget where he works now. Uh, there's second or third revision, revision of this book is out. Uh, it is written for managing software engineers, but lots of what he talks about is applicable just to working in IT in general. And we have a Google Doc um, that has a bunch of additional links that dive deeper into things that we've discussed, things that we figured out when we were researching this presentation. We reached out to these people, some of who are in this room today. Um, get some questions and some feedback, and we want to thank these people for t their time to actually respond and help us craft this presentation. 
That's it. Thank you. So. I'm going to put that back there because everybody wants that. Are we in a question? Okay, so people have to have questions. We won't necessarily have good answers. Yeah, that's the next one. Anybody Thank else want to talk about their job hunter experience? Uh oh. Whoop. I, I didn't want to knock your water bottle over, so I was shorting it, but. I appreciate that. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, so I'm, well, a lot of people know me. Um, Frogger, Mikey, Mike, Pudquick, Michael Lynn, the one that was on the side up there. Um, yeah, so um, I uh, have done this twice now in the past couple years, basically. So prior to, so uh, in June, I started at Facebook um, and joined the client platform engineering team there. Prior to that, I was working at Dropbox. Um, and then prior to that, I was working for the Department of Social and Health Services for the state of Washington. Um, uh, the Dropbox to Facebook transition was probably a little less scary, um, which a lot of people are like, well, v Facebook, um, uh, because they are of similar natures. Um, mm -hmm. The state of Washington to Dropbox transition, I never worked for uh, a, like a, you know, a San Francisco style startup private company before. Oh my gosh, that was terrifying. And, um, it's okay to be scared of making the change. Change is hard. Um, but I encourage people to consider definitely looking out of your comfort zone. Um, if where you're at is not meeting your needs in life. In my particular situation, I was actually extremely, extremely comfortable working for the state, such a laid back environment, pleasant people. I was, I was there uh, approaching seven years at that point. Um, but um, the reality of the situation is as even though I was personally comfortable, um, me is not just me anymore. I have a family. I have three kids. I have a house with a mortgage and they're growing up we're trying to do things like get college savings accounts going for the kids, you know, do right by our kids. And um, I uh, realized that from a talent standpoint, um, the people that I was talking to, I knew people who were getting paid considerably more than I was in private industry. Um, they were getting paid way more than I was in uh, working for the state. Um, so that's a trade-off. Are, uh, are, are you willing to trade a more laid back, much more, um, uh, as, not as fast paced environment in return for the less pay that comes with it? And uh, initially I was, yes, this is fantastic. This is a great life. It's laid back. I, it's a nine to five job. I'm done at the end of the day. I don't have a phone pinging me, blowing up because some service I created is exploding somewhere. At the state, everybody was gone by like 3.30 or something like that. So it was super laid back. But it was not comfortable for my family. Um, knowing, for me, knowing that I could do better by them. And I actually was prodded by a um, coworker of mine uh, at the state, suggesting that um, even though the state themselves would never, ever, ever fund me going to a Mac admins conference um, because it's the public money and they got to be, uh, you know, the, fiscally responsible, right? Like why, are, why is he going to a conference in LA? What's Washington state doing? Um, uh, they said, do it on your own dime. Um, go, find out what's out there. Um, and in the act of doing that, it was like Mac tech 2013 or something like that. Um, I, met for the very first time people that I had been talking to online in person. I met them like physically in person for the very first time. And that actually led 
to um, meeting um, a couple guys that were working at Dropbox at the time, uh, Nate Walk and, and um, Sam Keeley in person. And that literally led to um, getting an interview with them, um, them wanting me to interview with them. Like if I had not physically been there, I had been talking to them for the longest time and years and, and maybe eventually that would have happened. But it, there is, sometimes you just have to go outside of your comfort zone and explore what's out there and the possibilities that come as a result of that may shock and surprise you. At the time, they wanted me to work in San Francisco. And I said, no, that's definitely not something that I'd want to do. I want to stay in Washington State. Um, and again, going back to the you may not realize what comes of it, two years later, Dropbox opened an office in Seattle. And they came back again. And they said, hey, now we're in Seattle. <laughs> Can we talk to you again? And the conversation changed. But if I hadn't had that initial conversation two years prior, and if I hadn't been had that coworker saying, Mike, you just need to go out there, find out what's out there, and actually took his advice and, and got out of my super, super comfort zone, uh, none of this would have happened. And um, I, I just really highly encourage you, if you um, uh, look at, if, if you're here today, with this job board stop because it might possibly be something relevant to what's going on in your head about your current job situation. Um, uh, consider uh, even the, if something is a little bit scary, try it. Just d d make that leap a little bit because if you don't try, nothing ever happens. You will stay where you're at and you'll continue to have the thoughts that you're having there currently. Um, and I think getting to that too, um, one of the other tips we didn't really talk about was even if the role isn't 100% what you want, it's not a half bad idea to at least apply yeah. because that interview process, if, if you, once you, that first interview, is, you're going to be nervous as all hell. And, but as time goes on, as you have more and more different interviews with different companies, you're going to come into there a lot more confident and you're going to present yourself better. So when that job comes that you actually really do want, it's a much smoother process. Yes. Um, uh, I'm one of those Bay Area money for remote. We'll tenants. work remotely for Bay Area yeah. money. <coughs> kind of. A a actually, Facebook has a considerably large Seattle area uh, office. And um, there is, and I think they mentioned it here, there is um, um, basically um, area job market um, conversion differences, essentially, where uh, there's like San Francisco scale, but then comparatively speaking, Certain markets are a percentage lower than that and whatever. Um, Seattle, comparatively speaking, in the tech industry, there's actually a lot of companies in the area uh, moving in. That was one of the big circles there that was listed for uh, stuff. We've got, gosh, we've got everybody there now. Um, I just uh, found out there's Apple employees that I can go talk to up there. Apple Maps has a team up there um, now. Uh, uh, the... Um, the, the all the things to consider like look at all the things look at your benefits that they're offering you look at whether the state has state income tax or not california san francisco they pay a state income tax washington has no state income tax we only have federal um so yeah your paycheck may be down a little bit but you're also not giving an extra chunk of it directly to the state and on top of that the cost of living is also down so I actually, in the initial conversations that I, I mean, I didn't want to move to San Francisco, but to help justify that, my wife and I actually sat down in 2013 and looked at like the numbers, straight up numbers. And I, and that, you know, talking to trusted friends, I, I talked to people that were in the area and asked them like, would you mind telling me like what you're paying for mortgage and how big your house is and stuff like that and what your like healthcare costs and stuff. And I was fortunate enough to have some friends down there that were willing to give me those numbers. And I compared them to what we were paying in Washington. And I literally would have been upside down in San Francisco, even with a six figure salary going from like five figures in Washington state to six figures in San Francisco didn't matter. I would have been basically the effective of less take home pay for a smaller place, I, I own my house here in Washington State with property. And in California, I would have been renting a postage stamp and been upside down from a pay standpoint. So definitely, definitely look at 
all the things, not just the, the final number on the paycheck. Add all the other stuff up on too. And, and talk to other people. Uh, uh, you know, if you're not on the Mac Admin Slack, there's almost like 12,000 of us on there now. MacAdmins.org, free account to sign up. Um, ping me, ping any one of us. And uh, a lot of us are, are willing to just, you know, hey, I'm thinking about, mo I, I hear you're working out of whatever, you know, area and whatnot. Um, what's it like living there? Like, what's the cost of living on stuff? A lot of us will give you the numbers that we're paying out because, uh, you know, we want to help everybody out, not just like, like from a technical standpoint, but like, you know, everybody should be able to level up and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, I mean, I've so done that same thing where, you know, I'm applying for a job in California or Washington, you know, some people out there and be like, hey, uh, what's this like? You know, Joe knows. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. Oh, oh. sorry, sorry. Yeah. <coughs> trying, to trying to remember my question. Um, <laughs> I had a couple of them. Uh, so on, uh, kind of on the topic of, of never take less, right? Um, and it, it's kind of two, two sides of, of the same thought, but uh, one, side, one side of it is um, how, how would you recommend positioning yourself to a company that's asking for a certain amount of experience um, where maybe you don't have the time experience, but you have the experience because of you know, the position that you've been working in or you know, home lab projects that you work on and that kind of thing, but you've only been working in the industry for four years and these jobs are all looking for, you know, five to seven to 10. That's the tough thing because, you know, it's, it's often HR departments are writing the job description and it's not necessarily the hiring manager. Um, so it's kind of luck if you can get past the, the job, the, the hiring or the recruiter and actually get the interview with the hiring manager. That's where you can, you know, say like, hey, oh yeah, you know, I've only, you know, worked this place the past couple of years, but hey, I've been working on this project, this project. Here's you know everything I've been doing. I don't know. I don't have a good answer for that. Uh, it's just one of those things like you, you know. Remember we had the the Mario like the levels. You know maybe you can take the tunnel to get you to the next level, somehow. Uh, well, and it's, yeah, it's so that's that's the other side of my question is, um, does it make sense to consider something that is a, a, you know like a lateral move pay wise or you know balancing out you know cost of living and everything. Maybe it's slightly less on paper, but you're making the same or maybe slightly more moving to a different area. Um, but but so, so that on, on paper, your job, like, like, you know, I, I can move to a job where my job title would be a step up from where I'm at now, but the work would be far lower level than what I do now. Titles are all over the place. I mean, yeah. yeah. I've been like, I guess my question is, does that really matter at the end of the day, or is it mostly just the time that you've been able to put in and the experiences you're able to list and the skills you're able to list? So um, I've made both, I've made lateral moves and once or twice I've made a, a step back and I've never regretted the lateral moves. I've always regretted the step back. That's why I made a comment. Um, the lateral move, there's not, the lateral move is not necessarily a bad thing because it may be a more prestigious job or it may be a job with a better title or a job with less stress or with less travel, other side effects that will make your life better. Um, you know, and as far as your first question about, you know, how do I get past this? Again, that comes, you're, you have to become a salesman. And I know that's reversed to a lot of people in technical, you're, but you're selling yourself. You have to say, look, you know, and I wouldn't necessarily come up with this un until the recruiter says, well, you know, we're looking for somebody with two years experience and you only have one. You know, kind of like the, well, we're looking for somebody with, with 10 years of iOS development experience. Uh, yeah, they all work for Apple. You know, <laughs> but you've got to you be ready for that question. That's one of the questions that you should anticipate. And that's when you have your answer. Yes, I know I only worked on this for two years. However, I've worked at it at a very high level, and it's been a day-to-day -day project, and I've taken over the responsibility for my organization to do this. You know, you have to sell yourself on it. And then as far as the salary, uh, you know, I had mentioned that I left the job because just, you know, I couldn't put up with the hire, the, my manager anymore. Uh, when I switched jobs, I actually took a couple thousand dollars less because it was that important for me to get out from under him. So, I mean, you, you kind of had to think about, you know, talked it over with my wife a lot, but it's like, all right, yeah, th we can do this. We're going to have to make some adjustments, but that enabled me to get out from, you know, get away. Oh, yeah, you're back. Mm. Mm. Wait, wait. I'll give you this.
So this is being recorded. I was just going to follow up that even within like a, an organization like Penn State, you have like tier systems, like considering lateral moves, one college or inner college um, position scaling for those, those positions varies. Even though the positions are typed up by HR, a lot of the scale pay varies very significantly, five to 10%. So even a lateral move, you might go to another college where they value or they will put a higher percentage of value on that position just from a lateral move standpoint. Or like you're talking about position title, you might make less by thinking you're going to a gen position from a specialist position or go into a consulting role where you might not be as hands-on in technology, but you'll be involved in consulting matters. They put a higher value on that. So it's also about scaling up of uh, your, your perspective of uh, your career path. There's some dead ends and cul-de-sacs, as they had mentioned there. We see that a lot at Penn State. So just food for thought. I think one of the questions that you asked earlier on um, was getting past the hurdle of HR. Because, you know, again, the HR, you know, you know the, the, the joke about, you know, you get a stack of resumes. I don't want to work with unlucky people. You divide the resume stack in half and throw half of that in the trash. Well, if those people are unlucky, I don't want to work with them. Um, one of the biggest resources is the fact that you're here and the fact that you are sitting here. It's the reason why people go to legends at night and sit and talk or go to other events around, go to dinner, hang out in Slack because I mean a lot of it is even this year, and I, this is my fourth year here, I am still meeting people that, that I have talked to in Slack for the last three years. And what you'll discover is that, you know, okay, you, you see a job position, start searching, start trying to find out whatever position it is. Um, I'll take Mac management because it's easy. What product do they use? Because that can lead you to, okay, they're a Casper shop. Okay, go poke around in, <laughs> go poke around in Jamf Nation. See if you can find people who have worked there. It may not even be the immediate previous person, but fairly frequently, um, there have been jobs posted where it is that it is known in the community who the immediate previous person was who worked there, and you can talk to them. You can directly ask them, "Why did you leave?" Um, the community is a tremendous resource. The internet has a, has a very good memory. And that's something that is available today that wasn't available probably three to four years ago. There wasn't a large enough nucleus of people. And with 12,000 people hanging out in Slack, maybe you just search for the company name and you find somebody, oh yeah, they, they worked at such and such a place in Saudi Arabia. Maybe we should find out why they left. So yeah, because then once you find those people, maybe you find you don't want the job, maybe you find you do, and they are the, they know the hiring manager. And they say, sure, pass me your resume. I will pass it directly on to the person who will be hiring it, and you short circuit the HR process. I, I have a funny story about that, is that when I was in my job search, one of the companies that was, uh, that was looking was, uh, a large financial institution, and I saw one of the guys, I had applied for the position, and I ran into somebody, and Mac had been slack. I, and that was one of those things where I, you know, it was the void, the black hole. Resume went in, never heard anything, the job keeps getting posted, and I'm like, I can do this job, my resume is great. And I ended up run, stumbling across this person, said, hey, uh, I've actually been trying to get in there, and you know, I'm, I can't get a response. Next day, I get an email from HR. So he said something, he, he, he bypassed the process and we got through that HR moat, if you will, around the job. And the other thing, I mean, I, we kind of touched on this, um, but you know, depending on where you're at, uh, like in Chicago, uh, every job listing seems like they want jack of all trades. Like, oh, you can be managing the Mac, you can be managing the Windows machines, you can be managing this and that. Uh, versus it seems like on the coast, you can be more specialized. So I don't know where you're at, but I mean, Maybe you have X number of years experience, but it, you know, in where you're at, it might not 
work for you, but someplace else it might. And if you're able, you know, you have the facilities to move, uh, maybe that's something to look into. Uh, hopefully you don't have to move like across the country, but you know. Yeah. It's not It's, uh, like I know there's a lot, it seems like there's been a lot of listings in Atlanta lately. I don't know how close you are there. I'm in Charleston. Uh, South Carolina? Yeah. My wife just told me that we will not move to Atlanta if we do this. <laughs> <laughs> she will move anywhere else in the world. <laughs> well, if you go a little bit north of you, um, Raleigh, there's some stuff. I mean, that's very well, Linux-y. Charlotte, yeah. uh, some stuff in Raleigh, and then, you know, Richmond. And then Virginia. I mean, the... You know, Robert can speak to it more directly, but yeah, but the D.C. area is insane with job listings right now. I, I know somebody we actually need to talk to. He'll hit me up after the... <laughs> Anybody else have any more questions? <laughs> <laughs> See, it's networking. You know, yeah. it, even yeah. though there's 12,000 people in Mac Admin Slack, it's still a small community. Even if there's not someone there working for that company directly, someone might know someone that works for there. Yeah. I mean, you know, I am not by nature, uh, you know, a really talkative person. Uh, I'm online, it's very easy because I can type things out. I can think about it in advance. You know, my wife is like, all these people that you talk to online. I, but I mean, yeah, so it's just one of those things, you know. Um, you know, it's, it's whatever you feel comfortable with. But yeah, you know, get involved in some way. Uh, on Slack, I'm usually just making smart remarks. I mean, and even I, every once in a while I have a worthwhile piece of information, but yeah. Even if the conversation it's because I say, you know, go on Slack, talk to people. Even if the conversation that you're looking for isn't public, um, the Macam and Slack statistics are public. And if you look there, it's almost divided straight down the middle between channel discussion pub and, 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 and DMs. So the conversation very likely is occurring um, and this isn't necessarily picking on you, but um, get out there, talk to people. You, you'd be amazed what people will talk to you about once you work towards being a known quantity. You know, I personally want to encourage everybody to quit your jobs because I want to keep the job market really liquid so the bosses <laughs> are afraid. Uh, I mean, yeah. One of the th interesting things, too, uh, that I kind of want to bring up, um, by the way, I don't know how many people have heard of the Mac Admins podcast? Podcast.macadmins.org. So Jason and I had the honor of being interviewed uh, on this very topic uh, at a podcast that was recorded here at PSU on Wednesday night. Yep. So that'll probably be available online in the next couple of weeks. Yep. But one of the things that I uh, was thinking about this, because this is my fifth Penn State Mac Admins. I have uh, been everyone since 2012 except for 2015 because I got married the weekend before and I kind of didn't want to tell my new wife that hi honey guess where we're going for my honeymoon we're going to Mac Admin summer camp <laughs> because I'd be divorced <laughs> but um, a lot of the people are presenting a lot of people who've been here four or five times four or five years ago they were working at a school district or you know a hospital or whatever, or you know, you're working in the state of Washington, and they're now working at SAP and Facebook, Air, you know, Airbnb, very large companies. So what we've, it, it really has shown the people who've been in this industry for a while and have proved themselves have really risen. And that's only going to continue because I don't think, you know, not, despite what people want to think, I don't think the Mac um, penetration into the educational, business, government, industries is going to slow down. Uh, one of the smartest things that Apple did with the original Mac, and then they lost religion on it for a while, and then kind of Steve Jobs brought it back in the 2000s, was getting younger people to like the Mac and Apple products. And it, in some cases, it started with, you know, the iPod. And then people got Macs, and then they got iPads and iPhones. And as a result, as these people move forward out of school and into the workplace, they want to use the technology that they're familiar with, they've worked with since grade school, and you know, companies pushed back on this significantly, at least a lot of them. Some of the smarter ones came to this realization a number of years ago. Uh, I was actually involved with a bring your own device program at a Fortune 500 company back in 2008. So they were on the very leading edge of that project. Um, 
So kind of wrapping it up a little bit, try to come to this conference. Apply to present. Share your knowledge. Participate. Here, Mac and Slack. Because this oftentimes those jobs will find you. Yeah. This is my first year presenting. I mean, I came here last year, and this year I had the crazy idea of something to present and worked out with Robert. Uh, but there's also not just here. Um, there might not necessarily be a Mac admin group in Charleston. Um, start one. I mean, I'm involved with the one in Chicago. Uh, we haven't had a meeting in a couple months. We need to get on that. <laughs> but yeah, you know, uh, there, there was one. It started. It fell apart. A couple of us came together, uh, and we started it again. Um, just, you know, if you get like 10, 12, 15 people come into the meetings, we all talk about stuff. Um, hopefully someone gets up and presents on something. But it's a way for you to get to know people in your area. And that might be another way where, hey, something pops up. Or at the very least, you know, in an interview, it's something you can bring up. Like, hey, you know, I've been involved in the Charlton, or Charlton, Charleston, you know, uh, Mac Admins group for the past couple years. Um, just things like that. Because, yeah, I mean, spending, you know, $600 or whatever it is, plus the hotel to come to the conference isn't always <laughs> feasible, but something local uh, probably is. Got one more question. Sure. Yeah, shoot. Let me get it. <laughs> um, so something, something that, you know, I've, I've been looking for probably the past like three or four months, and I follow a lot of this. Like I'm, you know, I've, I, I'm a product of my generation. Like I'm an internet addict. I slack constantly. Like, you know, it's it's my life, but um, and may, maybe it's the locations I'm looking in, and you know, trying to be closer to you know certain areas, you know, closer to you know, like my wife's parents and stuff like that. Um, it, so it could just be you know purely location. Um, I I I I feel like most of the positions that I find that I think I could be qualified for or that I could do the job just barely. I like to get in a job where I can just barely do the job so I have plenty of room to grow. Yeah. Um, a, a lot, I don't, I don't tend to find any that are Mac, uh, solely Mac. And that like, might be just, you know, like I said, Chicago, there's lots of this split thing where right, they kind of so, want you to do both. So lately, like over the past few weeks, I've been thinking, okay, is it going to be worth me broadening my scope and doing something that does a lot more Windows for a while or you know, whatever? Because I've been I've been all Mac and all Linux, you know, for you know four or five years. Is it I, you know is it going to be worth it? Did I specialize too soon? Would it have been helpful to you know get some broader experience earlier on? I had Should to, I do that now? I've <laughs> done things like that in the past where it's like, okay, I know that's. The company, my job is going to be mostly Mac, but yeah, there's going to be the finance department who's all Windows. Or like when I, I used to work for one of the national laboratories, focus is going to be on the, the Macs and the division, but then also I was going to be the backup for the Linux guys. So I had to expand my Linux uh, skill set, you know, Linux at the desktop, not just Linux at the servers. So then you get to deal with fun things like making wireless cards work. Um, so yeah, no. Yes, I, I'm never going to say never try and expand. I mean, you know, I'm a Casper admin, but have been for years. I still look at stuff with Monkey. I want to try and figure it out better because who knows, things might change. Uh, so yeah, don't be afraid to do stuff new or do think new things. Um, no one wants to be a Windows admin, I don't think, but I mean, sometimes you have to be. Uh, and if anything, you know, that's one more sort of experience notch you have on your resume. Be like, hey, uh, not just Macs, I can do stuff with Windows. It's not my primary focus, but you know, I'm I'm confident in it. And if you're limited geographically that you're not going to be able to leave the area, then you need to find out what the skill sets are that are needed in that area. And uh, again, I do agree that it's something that you should do. I have another perspective on it in that I've been um, managing Apple devices since before the days of OS X. So back in the late 90s and early 2000s when Apple was doomed. And I had that question of, well, you know, I've got a lot of technology experience, but I've been working my mainly as a Mac admin. If something happens to Apple, what am I going to do? And I was actually able to pivot a little bit and pursue one of my other uh, technologies. You know, I went and got my CCNA. I had managed routers and switches before, but it was nice to actually be able to get the coursework and take the exams and get certifications, things like that. So that was, so I felt it was important to not only have a disaster recovery plan for the business I was working for, but also for my career. I actually, you know, I did a little detour where I worked, you know, one of the companies I worked for where I was the junior network ad admin because I thought, networking might be something I want to do. Actually doing it, I realized I'm just not that kind of nerd. That's a whole other complete skill set. 
I mean, I could do the stuff, but it's like I it didn't really make sense to me as much as I wanted it to be. What are so the seven I, layers of the OSI model? Well, Quick. not not even that, but just like routing and stuff. But uh, but you know, that's why I transitioned back into just being dedicated Mac. But you know, I did that detour, tried it out. Who knows? If it would have took off, I could have had that. So yeah, don't be afraid to try these things. And another so state of Washington, home state of Microsoft. Uh, yeah, I was doing Windows for seven years. <laughs> um, so also look at it as possibly the, the things that you learn are complementary to each other. Um, they can actually augment your Mac capabilities. I know more now about Macs and Active Directory interactions than probably a lot of other people. Um, it, because, and but the thing is, I also know the Windows server side of it now. So I can talk to the, because you run into these split infrastructure groups where you're like, as was mentioned earlier, it's almost antagonistic in some environments where, you're, oh, you're the Mac admin, you don't know anything about running real machines like Windows servers and stuff like that. Well, actually, at, now that I've done that work, I can actually say, no, yeah, no, I do know this. Can you go into this configuration setting area and change this setting on your servers because it's inter interfering with my devices? Because I've seen it from both sides of the coin now. So, um, yeah, like networking, Wi-Fi, like there's uh, several Wi-Fi talks that have gone on. These aren't separate jobs. These are different technologies that if your interest is in Mac admin, there, there's absolutely nothing wrong with looking at, at picking up those additional skill sets because they are totally complementary. Yeah, and you, you get this multiplying factor where now not only are you the, the, the Mac admin who's also been a network guy, but you know about Macs and how they work with networks. You know, you, you get this extra body of knowledge that you don't get knowing either of those jobs separately, but only if you've done both. And um, I definitely uh, recommend it um, also for the standpoint that um, uh, job portability, yeah, not all markets are super Mac markets. Um, so, uh, but uh, Windows is everywhere, networking is everywhere. It doesn't hurt to have those skills somewhere on your on your resume. Yeah, yeah and when and I have a similar experience to you, Mike, in that being, I, you know, having had that networking, you know, I've had Unix experience for years. I've had networking experience. I did run Windows servers probably up through 2008 server. So when I was a consultant, I had that same exact situation where I'm working with a client and I'm like, um, you have auto discover configured incorrectly. Well, it works on my Windows machines. Yeah, but it's not configured correctly because it doesn't work on the Macs. Well, I don't care about the Macs. Okay, but, you know, it, it, and it's an interesting too, kind of a diversionary point. Um, Macs are really good at finding problems in other environments where things <laughs> are not configured correctly because they are the veritable canary in a coal mine. DNS, auto discover, you know, anything like that that is not 100% set up correctly, the Mac's going to pick it up. And that, that's an argument for having a diverse user base where you don't go to a monoculture. Everybody's got a Mac. But again, having that, that experience helps you to find those problems and figure them out. And it makes you more valuable, whether you're an employee or a consultant. Probably have time for one more question because the time's running out. And I don't know. I think everything just kind of shuts off when that goes off. Last call for questions. All right. Thank you. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, Mike. Yeah, Mike. Mike. Throw him the box. I have a comment, actually. Um, as a sort of sidebar, I don't know what to call it, to what Mike was explaining. Um, the job, when I applied for my job, uh, the description said it wanted, like, oh, when I applied for my job, the description said it wanted, like, an expert Mac admin, an expert Windows admin for deployment. And I applied for it anyway. I'm not an expert uh, Windows deployment specialist. And when I got to the interview, and I interviewed, and I said, I'm really Mac. And they said, okay, thanks. And uh, when I got the offer and they brought me in, they explained that they already had someone who was very good with Windows, who was excellent with Windows, and they really just needed the Mac experience. And they were hoping to have sort of both people doing both, but they were willing to settle for one person doing Windows and one person doing Mac and having them both done really well. And so I'm glad that I, I wasn't, I didn't go into the interview saying what I thought they wanted to hear. I'm glad I, I said what I'm good at and, oh, yes. Yeah. yeah, take the chance. I mean, it doesn't cost you anything to apply. I mean. Yeah, it's, it, there, there's that HR gauntlet you have to run again. Yeah. So. Right, right. I, I think of 
job postings as wish lists, and you go in and you say what you can do and what you're willing to learn. All right, thank you for coming, everyone. Thank you.